Even on a dull, murky day, there's something special about the seaside. The sea mist shrouding the coast just adds to that magical atmosphere. When you think of the seaside, you immediately conjure up images of children playing in the sand, building sand castles, sticks of rock, fish and chips, a ride on the donkey, there's one just back there, and of course, the pier, for me, the most iconic symbol of any British seaside town. And we all love to have a walk on the pier. Now, here in the southwest, on this stretch of coastline of North Somerset, there's three piers within the space of 12 miles. And each one of them, in their own way, tells a fascinating story story of great British engineering and the seaside holiday in its heyday. The first pier to be built along this stretch of the North Somerset coast was Burnbeck in 1867, its Western Supermare's first pier. Following closely on its heels and just 11 miles away, Clevedon Pier opened on Easter Monday in 1869, making Western Supermare's Grand Pier the last to be built. The story of these three piers tells the rise and the fall of the British Seaside Pier. The flurry of pier building along Britain's coastlines was due in part to some significant social and economic changes of the time. Holidays were once the preserve of the upper classes. They could afford to travel anywhere, but for the working classes, that really happened in the middle of the 19th century with the coming together of the railway network, enabling cheaper travel. Now, combine that with the Factories Act of 1850 and the Bank Holiday Act of 1871, giving workers the right to time off. All of a sudden, there was a brand new captive holiday market. And the seaside was definitely the place to go. The Victorians believed that having a dip in the cold, salty water and breathing in the invigorating fresh air had restorative, health-giving qualities. And this in turn gave rise to the golden age of pier building as seaside towns up and down the country capitalised on this new wave of tourism. Piers began popping up all over the country. Around 80 were built between 1854 and 1904. It was the first golden age of the seaside resort. And the southwest was quick to make its mark. Burnbeck was the first of the three piers to be built along this coastline. And it's unique among piers as it's the only one to link the mainland to an island. Building Burnbeck was an engineering challenge. Fifteen groups of wrought and cast iron columns were floated across from Newport and screwed together into the seabed. This 1,040 foot pier was opened to a fanfare in 1867, with the day being declared a bank holiday. Paddle steamers brought day trippers across the Bristol Channel to enjoy the delights of the pier, which included fairground rides, cafes, and a water shoot. It's really hard to imagine now, when you look at Burnbeck, that it was once a successful and thriving business. To find out more about its illustrious history and how it fell into such a state of disrepair, I've come to meet up with historian John Crockford Hawley to find out more. Hi. Hello. <laughs> John, it's in a sorry old state now looking at it today, but it wasn't always like that. No, indeed. I mean, in its heyday, it'd be nothing to have six ships waiting to unload passengers and 15,000 people a day on the pier. 15,000 people yeah. a day? It, it, That's incredible, It isn't was it? the place to come. Huh? It was big business. Oh, huge business, yeah. So what happened to it once the Grand Pier was built? What was the competition like? Its livelihood was there as long as the paddle steamers came in. Right, and that's basically just that's to it. offload and onload yeah. passengers. Yeah. That's how it made its money. Well, it was partly that and, and the amusement arcades until the Grand Pier opened, and that yeah. was the competition. This place really began to decline as a, a pier of entertainment. What sort of purpose did this one serve during the Second World War? Oh, well, it was taken over by the Ministry of Miscellaneous Weapons Development. I've never heard of that before. They were known as the Weezers and Dodgers. <laughs> uh, and these great academics came down, yeah. um, chucking things into the sea and counting how many times they bounced. Um, the bounce 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 boun
designation. So when the Germans announced modern day, they had sunk HMS Birnbeck. Everyone, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Pull the other one. Um. <laughs> it's still here. So what was its demise? What, what turned its fate around? The change in tourism. The English were going to Spain for their holidays. Yeah. Uh, the Seven Bridge opened, which meant people could come to Western Sydney by car. And to make matters worse, Wales began to allow people to drink on a Sunday. <laughs> so they didn't come over from Wales to have a would come on a Sunday, people would have a drink here, Think then go that. back to Wales. The stories of Cum Ronda being heard in mid-channel as the last ship went home, you know, it's <laughs> legend. <laughs> All that changed. Oh, I, I, it's sad to see it like that. Yeah. It really is. What's your opinion on what's going to happen to it? Well, if nothing is done, she's going to fall into the sea. You and, can see and, that, and, that you? That'll be the end of her. But it's owned by a businessman who wants to get planning permission to build flats on there and flats on the landward side. And there's the big issue. Do you, do you allow it to be destroyed visually for its economic future? Or do you say, goodbye, old girl, mm. off you go into the sea? Sad as it is to see Birnbeck Pier today, it's worth saying that without it, it's highly unlikely this pier would have been built. By the end of the 19th century, Birnbeck over there was making so much money that the great and the good of Western Supermare just there looked out across the water and thought, yeah, we want some of that. So plans were drawn up and finances put in place to build a brand new pier, smack bang right in the middle of town. The Grand Pier opened in 1904, a relative latecomer really to the game. It was quite an undertaking, constructed of more than 4,000 tonnes of ironwork and over a quarter of a mile of decking. But in order to attract visitors, it went down a different route from its neighbour. What made it special was the 2,000-seater pavilion theatre and bandstand offering the crowds an alternative type of entertainment. But things weren't plain sailing for the Grand Pier. Tidal problems meant steamers couldn't dock there. However, the Grand Pier's location did prove to be an advantage over its neighbour, as it was right in the heart of Western. In the end, it was the Grand Pier that flourished, becoming a successful purpose-built pleasure pier in the 1930s, moving with the times. Its success was mirrored by Birnbeck's decline. While the Grand Pier went from strength to strength in the following decades, the Birnbeck fell into a greater state of disrepair, finally closing to the general public in 1994. But out of the three piers along this 11-mile stretch of North Somerset coastline, my favourite has to be the graceful elegance of Clevedon Pier. Unlike its neighbours, Birnbeck and the Grand Pier, it wasn't a place of entertainment, but rather a functional landing jetty. It provided a new fast route to Wales by steamer. Before the pier, travelling to Wales by train meant a much longer journey. New transport links hastened the pier's demise as a commuter route, but luckily it was able to capitalise on holidaymakers with paddle steamer day trips. Fast forward 100 years or so, and Clevedon remains very much a tourist attraction at the centre of the town. This small stretch of North Somerset coastline sums up the fate of this great British icon. Here we have Clevedon Pier. It's gone down the heritage route. And then you have the Grand Pier at Weston, a hugely successful business model, offering millions of visitors, seaside fun and entertainment. And then its neighbour, Birnbeck, that sadly lost out in the ebb and flow of history. And its fate looks very much uncertain.